Because the camera is there. Oh, it's on now. No, because of the adapter. And you just need to send that out to the ancestors. You should maybe swap the adapters. Yes. We have another. Let's use the Safari one. I have another one that we can have. What? I'm not sure. I think it's better now. Yes, you need to share your screen. Yeah. No. Okay, you just want to go back to this computer? Sounds good. You uh, I think so. They will go drive for us. I can send to this and they will address you. So far, we got presentation. The presentation of your talk. Give me that. Yes, my barrels. Is it on? It is, but I don't think it's going to sleep. And it won't. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you? Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our Safari Live Seminar. Um, I'm sorry for the problem in the beginning, I had some technical issues. Now we are all set and ready to go. So today here, uh, we have organized for, sorry, it's crazy again. Sorry, uh, he is uh, both a bachelor, a master and a PhD student at the Technical University in, uh, uh, in, in Israel. And today he's going to talk about uh, fast, reliable digital processing memory and talk about some of his work with being current being publishing venue and varying venues related to accelerate uh, applications and providing uh, fast ways of doing computation using processing uh, and memory architectures. So uh, please feel free to start and thanks so much for joining us today in Safari Seminar. And just as another thing, we're going to be taking questions on YouTube. So if you have any question on YouTube, feel free to ask. Um, we are going to ask them uh, over here. Okay. Here's good. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, today, as I said, we'll be presenting fast, reliable digital processing memory. 
And idea here, it's I've taken a few select works from my overall research, works that will probably be even relevant to you when you're looking at, for example, the processing using DRAM. And the idea is to present it to you so you can be more familiar with these approaches and perhaps to use it in your own works. So first, with some motivation, uh, we all know about the CPU. It's been developed for decades. And recently, we've seen that GPUs are emerging, initially only for graphics, but nowadays we see them almost everywhere, usually in machine learning applications where you have lots of vectored operations. You can accelerate them using GPUs. But if you look underneath the CPU and the GPU, the core difference between them is in a CPU, we have a few select cores that essentially can run any operation that we want. We have lots of control dedicated to that, to enabling us to run any program that we want. But in a GPU, we're dedicating much more of the chip itself to the logic, and we're limiting ourselves only to cases of vectored arithmetic. Basically, when we have many different ALUs processing with the same instruction. Now, today, we're going to be talking about something that we call the MMPU, or the Memory Processing Unit. And to see where the MMPU comes into place, we look again at the CPU and the GPU, and we notice that in both of these designs, we had a separate DRAM. We had everything above which was compute. We did have several small caches, L1, L2, L3. But essentially, we have this separation between an entire area that computes and an entire area that stores the DRAM on the computer. And we can generalize this to notice that almost every computer since the von Neumann architecture separates one hand, we have computation. On the other hand, we have memory. And if we have some vectored operation, for example, on data stored in the memory, we have to bring it from the memory to the CPU, process it in the CPU, and then bring it back to the memory. So nowadays, many times, this data transfer itself can be a bottleneck compared to even the computation of the arithmetic, which is why there are many different emerging solutions called processing in memory. You're probably very familiar with them where we're trying to shift the logic into the memory itself. So instead of that model where you take the vector, bring it to the CPU or the GPU, process it and bring it back, we're gonna send a single instruction from the CPU or the GPU to the memory. The instruction will encode some vector operation. For example, you have one vector stored here, another vector stored there, add them stored in the third place. And then we don't actually have to transfer the vector over the bottleneck, we only have to transfer the instruction because the vector instruction is much shorter than the data itself. Now, that's great. That's the overall idea of PIM. But now, how do we actually implement PIM? What does it mean to build a memory that also has logic capabilities inside? One approach is let's take the memory chip and let's add ALUs to the memory. Now, it's a nice approach, but the problem there is that you're essentially just changing the definition of what is a CPU and what is a memory, but now you just have a new bottleneck between the ALUs themselves and the actual physical memory. So yes, it can alleviate the bottleneck in terms of practical terms, but Fundamentally, we didn't change the way that we're computing. Here, we're going to be talking about a different approach to computing. It's based on the memristor. A memristor, it's a novel physical device. It was discovered, you can say, in 2008. We see a memristor here at the top. It looks like a resistor. It has some internal resistance. But if you pass a current in one direction through the memristor, then you can increase the resistance. So for example, here, when we pass a current from out to in, the resistance of the remister increases as we're passing the current. When we pass the current from in to out, the resistance of the remister decreases as we're passing the current. Now, the remister is also non-volatile, meaning that if we stop passing any current, it's going to retain the same state, even if we turn off the power. And that means we can already use it to store data. Let's say that a low resistance is going to be a binary one. A high resistance is going to be a binary zero. Now we're going to try and use our remister to store a single bit of information. So how can we do that? Well, if you want to write the remister, we apply a voltage and we choose the polarity according to the data we want to write. And if you want to read from the remister, then we apply a very small voltage, we measure the current, we divide, and then we can find what the resistance is. From the resistance, we know to differentiate if it's in logical zero or logical one state. So that is a remister just for memory. But now if you want to do processing memory, we're going to need to be able to compute with the exact same physical device that stores data. And that's where this circuit comes into play. Here we have three resistors connected together, and we're going to be applying two fixed voltages. For example, here we apply one volt, here we apply zero volt. And because of the structure of the circuit, the state of the remistor at the bottom, as the resistance of the remistor after the operation, is dependent on the states of the top two remistors. 
And we can show this dependence is actually normate. So if, for example, the first two mixtures stored zero, zero, then after we apply a fixed voltage of one and zero volts, the state of the bottom mixture will be the nor of zero, zero. And that means that we're applying fixed voltages on our mixtures by themselves of form computation. Essentially, we're able to use the same physical device, not only to store a single bit of information, but also to replace the transistor. That's something that can do very basic logic operations. Now, memristors are usually not found out in the wild as single memristors. Usually, we find them in a crossbar. A crossbar is where we have a grid of memristors, vertical bit lines, horizontal word lines. Each memristor is at a junction between a bit line and a word line. And first off, we can think of this as essentially storing a binary matrix of information. Each remistor stores a single bit. You have a grid of remistors. That's a binary matrix of data. Now, if we look at this circuit on the left, we can see that the same circuit exists within one row of this crossbar when we apply the voltages on the bit lines. So we choose three bit lines out of all the bit lines. On two of them, we apply the one volt. On the other, we apply zero volts. And now in that row, between the columns we selected, we find the exact same gate. Not only that, when we perform that gate, we didn't only perform it in the first row, we performed it on all of the rows in parallel. Each row performs its own NOR gate and has its own shared word line that it uses for the NOR gate, but they all share the same bit lines. And that means that we applied fixed voltages at the bit lines, and now all the, word, all the rows all performed a NOR operation independently. And this is going to be our most fundamental method for computation, because we have this binary matrix information that is going to be how we're going to store the memory. And we can apply these fixed voltages to cause the memory to compute inside without even needing to take the data outside of the crossbar. From now on, we're going to be talking in a much more abstract form, which is, as we said, a crossbar is a binary matrix of information. And what we can do is basically take two columns of this binary matrix, any two arbitrary columns, compute their bitwise NOR, store it in a third column, all in a single cycle. Right? Because what we did here, where every row before NOR gate is exactly identical to this model, and notice that it has to be column operations. So you can't, for example, have one row perform a NOR in one index and a different row in a different index. It has to be shared across all the rows, and that's how you get these column operations on the binary matrix. Now, this model, we can actually build to it not only from a mistress, which is just what we just did, but also from different approaches to processing memory. So you're probably all very familiar with AMBIT. Ambit is where you compute inside DRAM or using the DRAM itself. There you can do majority operations and you can look at the exact same approach. Everything's just transposed, but essentially you're still doing operations on columns of data in crossbars. So our goal is going to be able to assume this abstract model and then to use it to solve other applications and problems. And that means that if we have an algorithm for that application, we can choose what underlying hardware we want to use for that application. Now, we also not only have remistors and DRAM, there are also other approaches, for example, SRAM computing or FET, and then we show that they all managed to get to the same model of operations on columns in fixed time. Okay, so if we summarize our first framework for algorithm, we said operations in columns in O of one time, that's this. Sometimes we can also do operations on rows in O of one time. Here it does depend. With remistors, we can't do it if we apply the voltages on word lines instead of bit lines. With other technologies, it depends on the exact implementation. But sometimes we're going to assume only the first, sometimes we're going to assume both of them. So the first form of parallelism are these operations. Second form of parallelism tries to increase the number of column operations we can do per cycle. Because in the previous model, yes, we did an entire column operation in a single cycle, but we can only do one per crossbar. And if we think of the fact that the crossbar is n squared memristors, if n is the, for example, height, and then all n squared remisters can perform some computation. They're all capable of logic, but we only used O of n remisters every cycle because we only selected a single column operation every cycle. Now, the reason we had to do that was because of the shared word lines. When we went back to the circuit with three remisters, it only works if the three remisters share a word line and nothing else. If we want to extend that to provide more parallelism, what we can do is actually add these transistors. So here we're going to take the word line, we're going to add transistors in between our entire column of transistors. And we're going to be able to dynamically select whether or not to connect that word line. If we want, for example, in this case, to perform logic on all of them in parallel, then we disconnect all the word lines. Essentially, each one of these partitions can be treated as a smaller crossbar. 
And then we can use that to increase our parallelism. If you want to communicate between different partitions, then we can connect the transistors, and then we can transfer data from one to the other using, again, magic NOR operation. We're going to touch more on partitions later, but for now, we're all going to go to the third form of parallelism, which is crossbar parallelism. You have many of these crossbars in the memory. Usually, each crossbar is only one megabit, and you can have a memory of gigabytes. And what we can do is take the same instruction, share it across all the crossbars, and now all the crossbars are going to perform the same logic in parallel throughout the entire memory. And here, because we're doing the logic inside the crossbar, we're not bringing it to some external unit, then we don't have a problem with contention of that shared unit. All the crossbars operate within the crossbar. There is no shared unit they all have to wait for. OK, so that summarized our three different forms of parallelism. And our goal today is going to be to start with what we call the stateful logic gates. That is the norm, but you can also have other forms or NAND minority. From there, we're going to build arithmetic first. How can we do addition, multiplication, and division? And how can we do that with very high throughput? Lastly, we're going to try and look at applications. So we're extending all the way from safe logic gates to some larger application like neural networks. And the entire time, we're trying to use this very high throughput that we have for those bitwise operations and to use that to accelerate the large applications. OK, so as I said, the overview for today, we're going to start with arithmetic. We're going to look at different approaches to arithmetic. How can you do, for example, floating point arithmetic? Then we're going to move on to some examples applications. And at the end, we're also going to try and touch on different subjects, which is reliability. What can we do, for example, to improve the reliability of the entire memory if there are errors in the computation or if there are errors in need ECC? So let's start with arithmetic. First off, it's obvious that if you have NOR, you can build any arithmetic function. NOR is functionally complete. Functionally complete families can build anything. Then what's the problem? Well, the more fundamental question here is how do you expand from the NOR to arithmetic while keeping that very high throughput that you have for the gates? How can you perform many gates in parallel, for example? And for that, there are four different approaches that have been developed over the years. We're going to start with the top left approach. It's going to be called bit serial element serial. It actually isn't really used, it's just here for symmetry. But the idea is if you look at our crossbar, let's look at the first row. We're going to store two numbers. We'll call them x1, y1. Each one is going to occupy 32 cells if it's a 32 bit integer. Our goal will be to store the sum of x1, y1 in different 32 cells, and to do that using our column operations. What we can do in bit serial element serial, look at addition. Addition can be translated to a sequence of serial NOR gates, one NOR gate after the other, using some intermediate space to store results between the NOR gates. And we're just going to take that serial sequence of NOR gates, perform them serially on the columns. Each NOR gate becomes a column operation, but we're only effectively doing it for the first row. And now we get that we added x1 and y1 into x1 plus y1. So that's bit serial element serial. Here, we both have very low throughput because we're using only one row out of the entire row bar and a very high latency because we took addition, which can be made very efficient, for example, in a carry look at adder, but we're performing it completely serially. One NOR gate after the other, that also gives us high latency. Now, initially, many works looked at what we call now bit parallel and element serial. We're going to take the same approach of x1 plus y1 into z. But now we're going to use the entire crossbar to perform that operation. Essentially, if we have many different gates in that arithmetic function, that can be performed in parallel and can be aligned over different rows. Then we'll store them over the different rows. We'll use the entire crossbar in intermediate space. And then we can perform those NOR gates in parallel. Now, the benefit here is that we're reducing the latency. And only for very specific applications, for example, only for very specific functions, for example, multiplication, where it's very easy to parallelize n different gates at once. But we still have a very low throughput because we're using an entire crossbar to perform a single addition. In recent years, we've seen the trend go more towards bit serial element parallel, which says let's do the exact same thing as bit serial element serial. But now instead of only working on one row, we're going to work on all the rows at once. It's no longer adding two numbers, it's adding two vectors or multiplying two vectors. And each row is just going to perform its own logic operation. We get the high throughput from the fact that we're working on all rows at once. And latency is going to stay the same. So latency didn't change, but now we have much higher throughput because we're working on vectors instead of single elements. 
Lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about bit parallel element parallel, which this is where we try to use partitions to get the best of both worlds. We're both going to work on all the rows at once, but we're also going to try to utilize partitions to perform multiple gates of the same arithmetic function at the same time. Okay, any questions? Okay. So here we're actually going to show a recent work of ours. We released it just a few months ago. And this work focused only on element parallel. And within element parallel, we took four different arithmetic functions, add, subtract, multiply, and divide on both fixed point and floating point numbers. And here in this table, you can see the improvement first off over previous works. Green means that's the first work that solved this problem with processing memory. And the number under each title is the improvement over GPU. I'll come back to that later. So let's start with simplest case of element parallel bit serial. Here we said we want to add two vectors. We're using one NOR gate per cycle, but it's across all the rows at the same time. Here, the simplest case is bit serial fixed plane addition. And you're probably also familiar with it. Here, the idea is basically to take a ripple carry adder, to convert each full adder to a serial sequence of NOR gates, and to just perform them one after the other. And we're going to use the intermediate space to store the carry in between the different additions. So for example, if we have x and y and we want to add them, we'll start with a full adder that receives the lowest bits from x, the lowest bit from y, stores the sum in one column, which is going to be the alpha column, and stores the carry somewhere else. Then we're going to move on to taking the second column from x, second column from y, using the carry as an input now, storing the sum as an x bit of z, and the carry back replacing what it was. And we continue until in the end, we essentially did a ripple carry adder, and we are able to add the entire vector using O of n operations. If n is the representation size, for example, n32, then we're adding two vectors of any length with O of 32 operations. So this is the simplest case of bit serial fixed point addition. What if we want to do floating point? Well, floating point starts to be a lot more complex. First, what is a floating point number? Floating point numbers are defined by this equation here. We have x equals minus one to the power of s, times two to the power of e minus b, multiplied by one dot m. Essentially what this means, you can think of a floating point number as having assigned it. If s is zero, it's positive. If s is one, it's negative. That's the first part. Then it has a mantissa, that's the m, representing some form of the number in one dot something. And we also allow it to shift the number. That's the two to the power of e. e is going to be some exponent. And essentially the format is very similar to scientific notation that we use in decimal. We're trying to represent a very wide range of numbers, very small and very large, using, again, only 32 bits. Now, why is it difficult to add floating point numbers with processing memory? First off, let's take this example here. And the example is in decimal, but it's the same idea for binary. We want to add 9.7 times 10 to the 8 plus 6.0 times 10 to the 7. The first step that we have to do when we want to add these two numbers is to align. We have to replace the 6.0 times 10 to the 7 with 0 0.6 times 10 to the 8. Essentially, we're taking the larger exponent and matching the number with the smaller exponent to that larger exponent by shifting the mantis. Next, we can do just addition, 9.7 plus 0 0.6. Now we got 10.3 times 10 to the 8. But we're also going to have to normalize it. Because we went above 10, we have to change it to 1.03 times 10 to the 9. So if this is a basic idea to floating point, the middle stage, we already know how to do. That's what we had a second ago, adding two integer vectors. But the difficulty is in these two stages, alignment and normalization. And if we try to think what these stages really need, essentially, if we look at a crossbar, we're going to have some number stored in all the rows. It's going to be the mantissa of the number with a smaller exponent. And we're going to have some shift amount also stored in that row. That shift amount is going to be stored as a binary number. So for example, here in the first row, we have a shift amount of 5, and the second row shift amount of 3. And our goal is going to be to take each row and to shift the number in the row by the shift amount of that row. Now, if the shift amount was constant, the same for all the rows, then it would be easy. If we want to shift all of x by 1, all we need to do is a column operation between each bit and the bit after it go through the columns one after the other, and we're able to shift all of x by one to the right. 
But now we have a problem because each row needs a different shift. And you could say, OK, let's try to separate into different shift amounts. All the rows that need a shift of one, let's first shift them. All the rows that need a different shift of two, then we're changing it to something very serial and slow. So we need some way to take this operation and express it as only column operations. Column operations of NOR gates that always operate on all the rows at the same time. And for that, we're going to take two different observations. The first is what would happen if this shift amount was a single bit? Essentially, now we have an element, and we either want to shift it by one or we don't want to shift it by one. Instead of looking at it as what rows need to operate, we're just going to have all the rows operate, but with a multiplexer. The multiplexer is going to use as its select the element of whether or not to shift, that single bit of t in this case. And the two inputs to the multiplexer are either the column from x or the column of x from the index one before. So we're going to go through all the columns of x. And for each one, we're going to apply multiplexer. Select is t of that row. And the two inputs are that column before and that column shifted by one. And now what we got is because the multiplexer, all the rows perform the same operations. But the rows that have a one shift by one, and the rows that didn't have a one don't shift at all. So in this case, we saw the first three rows all shifted by one. The last row had a zero, so it didn't change. So this naive case of one bit shift, we can do it using only column operations. How can we extend this now to a larger shift? For that, there's a technique known as logarithmic shifting. We can look at this example. If you want to shift x by 11, we could shift x by one each time, or we could shift it just by 11 at once. Or we could think of 11 as the same thing as shifting x first by one, then by two, and then by eight. And what we did here is we looked at the binary representation of 11, that it has a one in the one, two, and eight locations, and converted that to this format. We're shifting by one, shifting by two, shifting by eight, and because the sum of them is 11, we get the exact same shift. So now, if we have x and three bits representing the amount of shift, what we can do is first of all start with the lowest bit. This lowest bit is going to tell us whether or not to shift by one. I'm going to do the same thing as before, take the vector, shift it by one or don't shift by one. So as we see, the first three rows all shifted by one, the last row didn't. Now we're going to look at the next index location. And we're going to apply the same idea as before, but instead of taking a distance of one between the columns, we'll take a distance of two. So now all the rows that have a one in that row are going to shift x by another two. So for example, in the second row, x was already shifted by one. We shift it by another two and get x to three. And in the rows that have a zero, it's going to stay unchanged. So in the second to last row, it was shifted one by one and stayed shifted as one. Lastly, we're going to look at the final location, the highest bit of t. That's going to tell us whether or not to shift by four. Again, we performed the same operations before, but now the distance between the columns is four instead of two or one. What we got is with a logarithmic number of steps, we're able to get any shift that we want. For example, x shift 11. Any row can have any shift amount that it wants. It can be different rows, different shift amounts. And it all still happens relatively fast because we're both utilizing the multiplexer to work on all rows in parallel. And because the logarithmic shifter gives us only logarithmic time complexity. So now, if we use this routine and go back to floating point addition and fix those two steps that we don't know how to do. First, the normalization, the alignment step. We need to take the one with the smaller exponent. It matches mantissa to the one with the larger exponent. That's exactly this case. And normalization is also very similar because in normalization, you either want to shift to the right once or you don't. And you can tell if you want to shift or not according to the carry bits of the last position. So we're actually only even using the one bit special case of this algorithm when we're doing normalization. So that means that if we go back to floating point addition, we're now able to do n bit floating point addition for n representation size with O of n log n. So it's not quite the O of n that we had for integers, but it's much better than O of n squared. And we're getting something that's still relatively fast, but now also knows how to handle floating point numbers in all the rows in parallel. Next question is, what about subtraction? Sounds pretty simple. If we know how to do addition, we probably also know how to do subtraction. The catch is there's one example, which if we take this for example, we have 1.0013 times 10 to the 1 minus 1.0000 10 to the 1. Now we're going to subtract them. Or first we're going to align them. There is no necessary alignment because they already have the same exponent. 
I'm going to subtract them. 0 0.0013. I need to normalize, but now it's not normalizing like last time. It's either bigger than 10, I need to shift to once or not. It's some unknown amount of zeros. And our goal is to shift that unknown amount of zeros to the left. And then also to report how many of those zeros that we shift. So we can think of this as we have a number shifted to the left until there's a non zero MSV. And also report how many you shifted so that we can fix the exponent. And call this step left normalization. So right normalization we had before, you either had to shift by one or you didn't. The left normalization looks even more complex because not only variable shifting, but now you also have to somehow guess how many zeros are there before the first one. Now, how can you do that while still working on all rows in parallel? So, as we said, we have x in each row. Now we don't know what t is. We need to figure out what t is. Each row needs to shift to the left until it has a one MSV, and also to write into t how much did it shift to the left. We want that to happen on all rows in parallel, and we still want it to be relatively fast. For this, the approach actually combines the variable shift from before with something inspired by binary search. We're going to think of the same thing that we had before, but now in reverse order. So before we started the lowest bit and went up, let's start at the highest bit. We want to figure out what is this highest bit for the shift amount. And we can look at all this data. And then we notice that if the first four bits of a row are zero, that means the shift amount has to be at least four. And if it has to be at least four, that means in the binary representation of the shift amount, the bit for four has a one. So if the first four bits are all zero, you want a one in the binary representation of the shift amount at the index of four. If there is something that is non zero, then we don't want a one. We're going to have a zero because shift amount is less than four. So when we're given the situation on the left, we start by first performing essentially an OR gate between the first four bits to find out if they're all zero or not. And then we use that to compute the shift amount at the index of the power for four. So now we know whether or not we need to shift by four. Now that we know whether or not to shift by four, we can use variable shift from four to shift by four all the rows that need to be shifted. So here we saw the first row shifted by four, the last row also shifted by four, because they were the only two rows that had the first four bits over zero. Now we continue. We have this stage. We're going to look at the first two bits. Here we see the last row has first two bits that are both zero. So we know that the binary representation of the shift amount is going to have a one at that location. So we can add that here. We have a one at the binary shift amount. And we're going to again shift by two. So now here we had three zeros to begin with. Now we only have one because we shifted by two. And then the last stage, again, we're going to look is the first column zero. If it is, then we're going to shift by one. If it isn't, we're not going to shift by one. Now, what we basically did here is we're interleaving the operations of variable shift with operations that discover what is the shift amount during the shift. It's not that we're trying to first compute what is the shift amount, for example, using full adders or something to see how many zeros are at the beginning and then we shift, because that would give us a much higher latency. Here, we're taking the same variable shift from before, adding a few OR gates in between, and actually have a very low impact on latency of the overall algorithm. And we're able to find the shift amount during the shift. Now, why is this similar to binary search? We can think of a binary search on where is the first one of that row. So for example, here, we're trying to find the first one using a binary search. Looking at the first four and saying, are they all zero? is the same thing as saying, is the first one in the first four, or is it in the last four? If it is in the first four, then we do nothing. If it's in the last four, then we're taking the last four, moving them to be the first four. And that's equivalent to the binary search where you're choosing which direction to go. So in a binary search, if you had a branch between choosing if to go to the left or to go to the right, here that branch becomes the multiplexer from variable shift, where it either keeps the row the same or it shifts from the right back to that location. So now that we have normalization, we can go back and say we also have subtraction. We can subtract n-dimensional elements, n-dimensional n-bit vectors with, again, O of n log n. And that completes our approach for floating point. If you're wondering about multiplication and division, actually multiplication and division are more simpler. When you multiply multi uh, floating point numbers, it's the same as multiplying the mantissas and adding the exponents. Division is dividing the mantissas, subtracting the exponents. So actually, addition and subtraction are the most complex cases for floating point. And in our paper that we just released, we include full implementations for all these algorithms, even including the specific details of IEEE floating point numbers. So for example, there are many different mechanisms for rounding 
and they're implemented exactly using only a sequence of nor gates nor operations. So if we go back to the overall image, this basically covers the first half. Bit serial fixed point is what we had in the beginning. Bit serial floating point is what we just did now. And we're going to talk a little bit about bit parallel algorithms. Here, again, our goal is to use partitions in order to get both higher throughput even and to reduce latency. So we're not performing the NOR gates one after the other like we did before. Now we can perform multiple NOR gates in one row at the same time. Here we're going to need to change our model a little bit. As we said, there are different partitions. For example, we can have 32 partitions for a row of 1,024 bits. That means that each partition has 32 bits. And if you want to store a number in a row, we're going to store it stripped. So the lowest bit is going to go in the lowest partition. The next bit is going to go in the next partition, and so on. So here, each column of partition belongs to a different number. The numbers are stored and stripped throughout the partitions. And our goal, again, is arithmetic. Take two indexes that represent different numbers, add them, store in a third index. And here we're going to go a little bit back to what are partitions and what makes them unique. So as we said before, we take a crossbar, we add these transistors. Here we have them as switches. We can either connect them or not connect them. When they're connected, then we can transfer data between two different partitions. When they're not connected, we can perform in two different partitions in parallel. So for example, if we connected all the partitions, we call this serial, we can do what we did before. No operations between arbitrary calls. But if we disconnected all the partitions, now we can do no operations in each partition in parallel, and that increased our parallelism by the number of partitions, and we're much better utilizing the crossbar. The only downside of this case is that we have much lower flexibility. If before we could choose any two arbitrary columns from a NOR gate between them, now we can only do that between two columns that are within the same partition. In arithmetic, for example, you need to communicate between different bits. So if you're storing the number in a stripe format, you can't usually do only an operation on each bit independently. And for that, we turn to something that we call semi-parallelism. This is what happens when you connect some of the transistors, disconnect others. You're still connecting an entire row together. But for example, in this case, these are connected, these are disconnected, and these are connected. And now we get something in between. We can do, in this case, only two gates simultaneously, but each gate is within its own partition section. So now we get moderate flexibility and also moderate parallelism. Now, rhythmically, this gives us a very interesting model. And we can use this, for example, in a shift technique. Let's say that all the partitions have some bits stored in a column, and you want to shift. You want each partition to send its bits to the partition to its right. If you were doing this completely serially, it would take O of the number of partition cycles. You go through each partition, copy the bit from here to here, here to here, and so on. And you can't do it fully parallel because you need to communicate between different partitions. With serial, with semi-parallelism, we can actually do this in two cycles. In the first cycle, we copy from all the even indices to all the odd indices. So in this case, partition zero copied to partition one, at the same time, two copied to three, four to five, six to seven. And we did that by connecting alternating transistors. And then we swap. Now all the odd indices copied all the even indices. And that's the second cycle. And we got a shift of k bits in two cycles using k partitions, instead of the k cycles it would take if we didn't have partitions at all. So this is actually a relatively simple example of shift. In our paper, we present four different techniques. We call it a partition toolbox. First is shift, where we do it in O of two. After that, we have broadcast where a single partition stores a single bit. We want to broadcast it to all the other partitions. Essentially here, it's a tree structure that gives logarithmic time complexity. We also have reduce, that's the other way around. Each partition has its own bits. We want to compute, for example, the and of all the bits stored in a single partition. That's a reverse tree and also log of k time. And then there's the special operation at the end. We're going to come back to it in addition. It's called prefix. Each partition needs to get, for example, the and of all the bits from the partition before it. Generalizing reduce, but instead of only reducing to the last partition, we want to reduce to all the partitions, or each partition gets the reduction of everything that came before it. So these are the four different techniques for the toolbox. We can use this, for example, in multiplication. We're now, instead of looking at the multiplication as a serial sequence of NOR gates, we're trying to look at it as something we can parallelize. This is known as a CSAS circuit, it's carry, save, add, shift. And here it's a regular circuit that treats multiplication as a bit serial process that receives a single bit from B at every time, but operates on all the bits of A simultaneously. 
We have n different full adders. Each circle here with a plus is a full adder. They all operate at once. And we also have, for example, here, communication between the full adders. That's the arrows to the right. So we need to communicate with each other. So we can directly take this approach to multiplication from regular VSI circuits and translate it to our solution. We're going to perform the full adders in parallel using a full parallel solution. And then for the shift, we're going to use the shift technique. And also, we have a broadcast here at the beginning because we get a single bit from B to send it to all the partitions. And that's utilizing the broadcast technique. So now we're taking this parallel circuit, we're adapting it to our model using the techniques to do it efficiently, and we can multiply two n-dimensional n-bit vectors instead of O of n squared. So for example, 32 squared, if we're working bit serial, because we have 32 squared different NOR gates they need to perform. Here we do it in 32 log 32, because we're able to operate with 32 different partitions parallel. There's also the converse case of division. In division, it's actually a little more complex because you also need a carry log ahead. We won't go into the details now, but essentially you need to guess whether the current sum is positive or negative, and you do that with the carry log ahead circuit. But at the end of the day, we also get to n bit vectors with O of n log n. And then there's also addition. Now, addition up until now, all we did was ripple carry addition, which is O of n, it's the slowest form of addition. But in regular circuits nowadays, they don't use carry log ahead, they don't use ripple carry, they use carry log ahead. There's actually a special form of carry log ahead added called parallel prefix. It's taking addition, formulating it as a problem of prefix, where each operation is a slightly more complex prefix operation. And now what we can do is take the same prefix model from before, apply it directly to addition, and we compute all of the carries at all the positions at once. And that gives us adding n bit vectors with O of log and latency instead of the O of n from before. And now, if we go back to looking at the overall approach, we said that we just did bit parallel, uh, element, element parallel, bit parallel, which is with partitions. And now we're going to go back and compare the results, first off compared to previous works. So as I said before, the color coding is compared to previous works. Green is the first work that solved this problem using the abstract model of processing memory. Then we have a greater than 5x and less than 5x improvement on the algorithm. Gray didn't change. We also have here the different techniques that we used for each one of these cases. And we're also going to try and compare it to a GPU. As we said before, in GPUs, when we do purely vector arithmetic, two vectors, we need to bring them to a GPU and add them, we're bounded by memory. We want to verify that here. So we generated vectors of n equals 64 million elements. And we took NVIDIA, NVIDIA RTX 3070 GPU. We ran vector addition with vectors of n equals 64 million elements. And what we actually observed is that the throughput that we get is bounded almost exactly by the maximal throughput of memory. So because a vector addition doesn't have high locality, you're bounded almost exclusively by the memory, and you can reach the maximal theoretical memory throughput, but not more than that. And that's why when we look at our approach that's based on processing the memory, it doesn't have to transfer the data. And we're finding numbers for our approach based on the racer architecture. It's a recent work that's published in Micro. Then we see here on the bottom numbers that are moving over GPU. So for example, in the simplest case of bit serial addition, we get a thousand X improvement over GPU in the throughput for again, very low locality. And if we even go to bit parallel fixed point, then we get 6,000 X. That means that the bit parallel algorithm is six times faster than the bit serial algorithm for 32 bits. And here we fill in the rest of the table. All you can notice is as the operation gets more complex, the improvement gets smaller because we're performing more operations in PIM for every data, for every byte we would need to transfer to the GPL. That's why, for example, in multiplication division, we get a 30 or 20x improvement. What's nice is that if we look at floating point, then we can get floating point addition subtraction with still parameters that are very competitive compared to GPL. Yes, there is roughly a 4x reduction. Also depends exactly on which floating point algorithm to use. But if processing memory solves the bottleneck to such a point that the data transfer is orders of magnitude slower, then you can also use floating point algorithms now for problems that you can never solve processing memory in the past to accelerate them using processing memory now. Okay, any questions on arithmetic? Uh, we have a question in the audience. Yes. Uh, so you about the prefix operation. So the question is that you are showing uh, basically a prefix sum operation, mm -hmm. and and the audience said that he thinks that you are doing the range count algorithm. Yeah. Um, 
and is asking if other uh, setup or other algorithms would be efficient as well as the constant, uh, for example, compared to the to the to the common algorithm. Okay, so answer quickly because the full answer requires something that wasn't in the presentation. But what we want to do with partitions is sometimes also to standardize the model of which are connected, which aren't. If we allowed each one of 32 partitions to either be connected or disconnected, that's two to the power of 32 possibilities. And if we wanted to send an instruction saying which partitions to connect and which ones not, that would be another 32 bits. Instead of that, we propose some models that try to reduce this. For example, only looking at patterns. So before we had this pattern of these two are connected together, these two are connected together. We're trying to exploit those patterns to reduce the amount of bits that we need to represent the operation. And when you look at those specific patterns, Brent Kung, I believe, is the only algorithm that can fit with the structural patterns. But yes, you could use other approaches, but then it wouldn't conform to the more minimal model for the operations. OK, so now we'll move on to applications. And here our goal is to use this very high throughput that we got for Arithmetic and to try and demonstrate some applications with it. And if we look at our lab, there are actually several applications that we're looking at right now. One, for example, is databases, a paper called PinDB. We're using this vector at Arithmetic to accelerate database filters and searches. We can operate on all the rows in parallel, where each row stores some record of the database. Another application is cryptographic hash functions. We're trying to compute them efficiently within the memory. And today we're actually about talking about two applications. One is matrix operations. So we're going to have matrix multiplication, matrix convolution. And the second, if you get to it, is going to be fast Fourier transforms. So as I said, today is going to be matrix operations and F15. And within matrix operations, we have two types of matrix operations. The first is matrix multiplication. We want to do it on full precision numbers. And the second is going to be convolution. So we're going to start now with full precision matrix multiplication. And there's actually a very naive approach to this matrix multiplication existed in previous works. So for example, if we have in our crossbar stored a matrix A presented by these elements, which stored as exactly a matrix in the memory, and each element is 32 bits, then we can store the matrix here and want to multiply the matrix by some vector X and store the vector next to it. And what we can do is, first of all, duplicate the vector across all the rows. Here we're using the row operations that we mentioned that sometimes exist before. And then each row just can perform an element parallel dot product. Each row takes the first element of A in that row, multiplies it by the first element of X, takes the second element from A, multiplies it by the second element of X, adds it back. Does a dot product within each row, and now we get the matrix vector multiplication AX stored in the last column. And the only problem with this is that if you notice, a was very non-symmetric in size. If we go back here, A has 1,024 rows as a matrix, but it only has eight columns. And the reason it only has eight columns is because our overall crossbar is limited to 1,024 by 1,024 from physical limitations. And when we store the numbers horizontally, that means that each number takes up 32 bits. So we have this very significant asymmetry where on one dimension it takes one bit, and then the other dimension takes 32 bits, and that gives us very non-symmetric sizes for A. So why theoretically you could multiply matrices that have 1,024 rows and eight columns, practically it's not in use too much. And that's why we actually try to go back to the theory of matrix multiplication to support more symmetric dimensions. So here we're using a very simple concept of matrix multiplication, it's called block matrix multiplication. If we have a matrix A and we split it into the left half and the right half, we have a vector X split into the top half and bottom half. So the matrix vector multiplication AX can be expressed as A1X1 plus A2X2. Essentially, we're even looking at this as a matrix multiplication between these two vectors, just in the dimension where every element is a matrix itself. Now, if you have this equation and we go back to what we did before, let's say that someone gave us a matrix A of size 512 by 60 instead of 1024 by 8. We're going to first split the matrix into the left half and the right half, and we're going to store the left half at the top and the right half beneath it. So now we're still using 1024 rows. 512 times 2, we're using the same number of columns. We're going to take the vector x and do the same thing. We're going to split the first half of x at the top, second half of x at the bottom. Now we're going to do almost like before, each vector is going to be copied to its remaining rows. And now again, element parallel dot product, and we computed a1x1 and a2x2. 
All that's left is to add the two of them together. And for that, we shift a to x2 to the right and upwards using row and column operations. And now we can add them using element parallel addition, and we just got ax. So we took the more complex operation that's not asymmetric, we split it into something smaller, and then we aggregate the results in the end, and we get a of x. Here, a of x is of size 512, and can extend this to almost any matrix dimension. So if today we did 512 by 16, we could do 256 by 32, et cetera. And then we have much more symmetric matrix sizes that we can use. So that was matrix multiplication. It was a very simple example for how we can use parallelism to perform matrix swap applications. Now we're going to look at convolution. And convolution is a little more complex because convolution is not as easy to parallelize. Usually when we think of convolution, we look at every element in the output of convolution. So for example, here we have A convoluted with K. We look at every element of the output and we say, okay, that element is computed by taking the kernel, putting it above A at the index, multiplying and adding, and that gives us the element, right? Then we can go one element at a time. Each one is that dot product of K with that region A. Now, what happens if you try to parallelize that? Well, you could say when we compute each dot product, we compute all the parallel, all the elements at once, all the multiplication at once, and then some form of reduction. But we actually thought of a different way to think of convolution that's much easier to parallelize. First off, take the entire matrix A, multiply it by the top left element of the kernel. So here we have all of A multiplied by the green element. And the reason for that is if you look at the output of the convolution, every cell in the output is going to have the same cell of A contributing to the sum multiplied by the green element of A. So first, we're adding all of that impact to all the cells in the output. Then we take A, shift it once to the left, multiply an all of it by the yellow, and add it to the fourth. Shift it once to the top, multiply it by the orange, and shift it to the top and to the left, multiply it by the turquoise. What we're doing here is expressing convolution almost exclusively as operations will take an entire matrix multiplied by a single element and add it to a previous matrix. That makes it much easier to parallelize convolution than before. So in the paper, we have the full details of, for example, how can we do the shift? If we want to shift to the left, you don't even have to shift to the left. You can just select the elements shifted by index. But we're going to skip that for today. The overall idea was how to take convolution, which is usually computed in output parallel form, convert it to input parallel so that we can do something more parallel at all once. So those were matrix operations. Now we're going to mention the fast Fourier transform. So this is the reason we're going to release it in a few days. And here, the fast Fourier transform, first off, the DFB is defined by this formula. And it's used in many different applications, for example, in signal processing and even in computing convolutions. Uh, today, we're going to focus on FFT, which is an algorithm for computing DFP with n logarithm time complexity. And specifically, there's this circuit of FFT. It's called the parallel FFT circuit. And we have the inputs starting on the left. We first have to permute them in some form. That's this step here. But then every time we have these butterfly operations, they're called, they receive two elements of the vector, perform some logic on those two elements, and output them. And specifically, that logic is you get u, you get v, you also get a constant omega, and you output these two results. What's interesting here is that every yellow box contains n divided by two different butterfly operations that are completely independent. They operate on different elements of the vector, and thus we can perform them all in parallel. So if you want to compute FFT not with n log n time complexity, but with log n time complexity, then we can look at the circuit. Every pair of every group of n divided by two operations are executed at once on a parallel processor. And then we only have log n stages to compute the DFT. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, the challenge here is how do you get the elements to be aligned at the right place at the right time? So what we knew how to do so far is vector operations, but only when everything was aligned. Only when the two vectors are completely aligned, one on each column, each row has one element from one, one element from the other. Now we need to start to mix between the elements. And for that, we need some way to make sure that all the elements are going to be at the right place at the right time when we want to do operations on. So for example, if you look here, at the beginning, we had these n divided by two operations, each one operating on two elements. And let's say that to begin with, we stored the data such that all the elements are just stored one above the other. 
If we wanted to perform this operation, we could shift half of them to the right, shift them upwards. Now we have each row containing the pair that it represents. So for example, here, x0 and x1, x2 and x3, and so on. Then we perform the butterfly operations because it's simply a sequence of arithmetic. And then we move it back. We take the shift to data, x tag, we shift again down and shift to the left. What we did here is we performed that step while starting and ending the sync configuration. And for the next step, where we have a butterfly operation that, for example, goes between x0 and x2, we'll shift x2 to the right, shift x2 to x0, and so on. So we can take the circuit from before and just perform it serially using this. But actually, there is an optimization here. First off, we notice that we only used half of the memory at a time. We have an overhead that's twice the size of the vector itself. We can start by storing the data not in this form, but across all both of the columns. So now, for example, we're going to take 16 elements instead of 8. We're still going to store it on 8 columns. We're going to store it according to the first configuration. And now we want to move from configuration to configuration. We're not going to do these serial steps that go in between the rows. We're going to identify the net swap things we performed. For example, here we need to swap x1 and x2. We're going to perform only those net swaps. And if we do this, then we're getting an FFT of double the size with the same area utilization and actually almost identical latency. Because before we had the capability from butterflying all the rows in parallel, but we didn't. We only performed it on n divided by two rows in parallel. Now we're taking the same butterfly operation, performing on all rows in parallel, so latency doesn't change. And in the end, we took this approach to FFT and we're comparing it to the state of the art GPU solution. It's called Quick 15, it's library given by NVIDIA on two different types of GPUs. And we take again parameters derived from the racer architecture for processing memory. And we get here the results for both full precision floating point numbers and half precision floating point numbers. And you can take a look later. We're comparing both throughput and energy. Okay, any other questions on applications? Anything on YouTube? No, no. Okay, great. Now we're going to try and talk about what are the challenges that remain for this processing memory model. Yes, up until now, we said, look, we have this very high parallelism for logic gates. We can expand it first to arithmetic event applications, and we have this very high throughput that can compete with even GPUs today. Well, what about the challenges? Well, one of the large challenges is reliability, and it comes in two different forms. One is the fact that when you compete an OR gate, sometimes an OR gate isn't correct, and you have to deal with that. And the other is that memory itself usually has soft errors. Data is corrupted over time, and that's why memory today uses error correcting codes to correct the data over time if it has soft errors. But it's not clear how to do that with processing memory. So that's reliability. There also the challenge of endurance. Specifically with memristors, the endurance of memristors can be relatively low. It depends significantly on the technology for the memristor. But here, for example, we can say the same approaches that we developed for uh, the same algorithms we developed for memristors also apply to DRAM. And DRAM, we don't have a problem of endurance, but you still have the reliability issue. And I think the third challenge is the architecture side, where we're trying to take an existing architecture that has many different ideas like virtual memory and cache coherency. And now we need to somehow define something new that is able to process within the memory while still maintaining all of the conditions. So today we'll talk a little bit about reliability and what we can do from an algorithmic perspective to increase the reliability of the system. And here we're going to talk about two different works. The first is in memory error correcting codes. How can you still perform error correcting codes within the memory while maintaining the benefits of processing memory? And the second is how can we address the errors in the computation itself? So we'll start with in memory ACC. First off, for ECC, for those of you that aren't familiar, it's a way to increase the size of a message, but encode it in such a way that if you have an error, then you're able to find what that error was and decode it. And traditionally, memories today use ECC. For example, DRAM uses a hand code usually. And what you want to do is when you want to write to the memory itself, for example, you want to write 32 bits to the memory, you take those 32 bits on the interface, you change it from 32 bits to the larger representation, for example, 36 bits of the code, then you store all 36 in the memory itself. And then when you want to read from the memory, you take all 36, you decode them. Here, you're looking to see, are there errors according to the code? If there are, fix them. And then you return only 32. So traditionally, we encode a long read and we decode a long, and we encode a long write, we decode a long read. Question is, now we have processing memory. The whole point was the data doesn't go through the bottom, the bottleneck, which is this interface. 
Instead, we have this control operation that comes into the memory, does it have the data, and it changes the memory inside. So what can we still do? How can we perform, how can we support a memory that has ECC while still enabling gun operations? Okay, our proposal is going to be to use PIM itself, use the same concepts from before, like arithmetic, but to implement the error correcting codes. We're not going to have an external encode and decode circuit. We're going to implement the error correcting mechanisms using a sequence of more gates, for example, and I'm going to do it all together within the memory. So we can think of it like this. If we had, for example, addition, addition had input and it had output. This would be x, y, and this would be x plus y. And we had some intermediate cells in the middle. Our goal would be to take an algorithm for addition, change it to an algorithm that first decodes the ACC of the inputs, then performs the addition itself, and then encodes the ACC for the outputs. And this way, we're maintaining the fact that over time, the data is still store encoded. We're storing the data in the long run encoded, but we can process that data without having to decode it externally. Now, the question is how can we perform it efficiently with a low overhead? How can we perform this decode and encode while using PIM and not ruining the parallelism or decreasing the throughput too much? And here we're going to start with one solution. This works for the 1D case. For example, this would be relevant to works like AMBIT, which only process on one dimension. Here, Let's assume that instead of having x and y before, we have phi of x and phi of y. That's going to be the encoded form of x and y. And they're stored here, say, on 36 bits each one. If we want to add them, then the first thing we do is we run a decode algorithm. We think of decode as an algorithm, we convert it to a sequence of more gates, and we perform that more gates to go from encoded x to x itself. Then we do the same thing for y. We convert it from encoded y to y itself. Then we have the actual numbers x and y. We can add them. So we have x plus y into z. And now we take z and we encode it. So now we have phi of z stored. This is going to be the output that we store. So over time, when we use this for the next iteration, we're going to have the data protected over time. And when we decode it, we can find if there are any errors. Now, this is the overall idea. One challenge here is to find codes that you can encode and decode easily. And especially with decode, you need to find a code that can correct the operations while still working in complete data flow. And for that, we're exploring several different codes to see exactly which ones can be implemented here. But we found solutions that can provide us with the latency overhead. Now we're going to move on to a 2D solution. Here, the challenge is that we can't work on one dimension anymore. So in the previous case, we said all we ever want to do is take two vectors and add them on one dimension. But now we have to ask, what if someone wants to support an operation on a different dimension? For example, a NOR gate between these two rows and to this row. How can we still support that operation with a low overhead? And for that, we have this work that was published in last year's stack that designs an architecture that stores parity bits, actually along diagonals, because we found the diagonals are both perpendicular to the row operations and call operations. And then using that, we're able to store the check bits separately. We have this check memory that stores only the check bits. We have the data stored in the main memory. And we do this for every single crossbar. And then we're able to provide, again, low throughput degradation for the case of even 2D operations. So if you're looking only for 1D operations, the previous solution will work. But if you also want to support 2D operations, then there's this more complex solution that involves different periphery that enables that as well. Okay, any questions on ACC? I have a question actually. Yes. So I, here you are filling portions of the of the CC computation or the entire like encoding the code into the memory. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was wondering what happens if the memory itself fails? Because for example, when you do a majority operation in RAM or when you do a next slide here. Okay, good. Great question. It fails. So just let me go. no. Uh, <laughs> so I was wondering. Okay, so next slide. What can we do there? Okay. okay so any more questions? Nice easy. Okay, so here we're going to think about the second type of error. So the first type of error is errors that happen over time. We want to be able to store the data in an encoded format so that even if they occur, you can correct them. What about the computation errors? You perform majority, and the majority isn't always right. Or you perform more, the more is not isn't always right. For that, there is a very simple approach. It's called TMR. It's actually used a lot in space exploration. And it very simply says if you want to if you want the computation to be more reliable, compute it three times and then take a majority. So, for example, in this case, if we have two vectors x and y we want to add, first we're going to add them to this column. 
And here, the dark green represents an error. So we didn't actually get x1 plus y1. And then we're going to do it again. So here, and here the error was in a different location. And then we do it a third time. And here we notice that every single row has at least two copies that are correct. So if we take a majority vote, now majority is also implemented using processing memory, then you can get that entirely that's correct. Now, this is the overall idea, but there are many different implementation details you can do to make it more efficient. For example, there's a question of what level do you perform the PMR at? Do you perform it on all the addition? Do you perform it on intermediate steps within the addition? And so on. And then there's another question, what if the voting itself isn't reliable? Because the majority operation good here is also prone to errors. And there's actually a lot of theory, again, from space exploration on what can you do when the voter is not reliable. Essentially, you can do voting three times and then vote on that. But we're going to take stop here with the overall idea of TMR. And we're trying to take unreliable operations, perform them multiple times, and then vote to get something more reliable. And here we took a case study now to try and look at both ECC and TMR. Looking at the implementation of neural network acceleration, it's based on AlexNet. And we're looking, first of all, on the weight degradation. The weights are stored over time inside the memory. We're using the weights, what happens to them. And here, what we can see is the time overall of a chip. So it's measured here on how many batches we performed of the operation, of the neural network operation. And we have the expected number of corrupted weights. So in blue, we have what happens if we didn't do anything at all. So for example, we can see that at after roughly 10 to the 7 batches, almost all the weights are corrupted, which means the models can be useless. But if you look at these solutions, here we have different plots depending on what the input error is. And for some of them, we get a very significant improvement. For example, here, we only have less than one weight corrupted on average. So this is weight degradation. We're trying to protect the weights over time. The other aspect is reliable feed forward. Now here, we already chose an application where it's very error prone and where it's very not sensitive to errors because neural network acceleration, you have very significant operations like ReLU that reduce many different errors. But we can still see that if you didn't do anything at all, if you took the baseline model, then the accuracy of the model decreases significantly. But if you do perform TMR, then you can protect the accuracy of the model while not degrading the latency too much. Okay, any more questions on reliability? Okay, so just to summarize, we started by talking about processing memory. And we said we have this massive potential for bitwise operations. We can do many different nodes at once. How can we use that? And the first thing we did was arithmetic. So we devised two different methods for arithmetic. One we called the element parallel bit serial. We just perform a single NOR gate in each row at a cycle, but in parallel across all the rows. Then also a more complex version, bit parallel element parallel. We're using partitions to perform multiple gates at once to improve latency. And in both of these models, we looked at complex functions like floating point arithmetic where you take a problem that seems almost completely not applicable to PIM because you have operations that depend on the data itself, like shift, but you're still able to map it efficiently to PIM by using tricks such as the multiplexer and logarithm shifting, and also the binary search. After that, we moved on to applications. We're here the goal is to use the high throughput arithmetic that we have towards some larger application. And we looked at matrix operations and also FFT acceleration. And at the end, we tried to find what are the still remaining practical challenges. One of them is liability. And essentially, we're trying to compensate for the lower liability of the device with different algorithmic techniques. One was how do we still perform ECC even though you don't have the data flowing through the interface? And the other was what happens when there are errors in computation? And then you can perform TMR to reduce the error rate. Okay, thank you for listening. And yes, are there questions? Um, uh, my question is like from the rapidity size, like your ECC, how much it increases in terms of energy consumption? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. The second question was the is the performance of the laser application high up, very up, um, significantly affected by the ECC? Like the PM without and with the ECC, you see any significant okay. performance and energy consumption in the workloads you did before? Okay. Uh, off the top of my head, the numbers for this case, because we have this separated check memory, the idea here was essentially something similar to partitions, where if they're disconnected, we have here an enable that disconnects them, then we can operate in the mem and in check memory simultaneously. So for example, the addition is performed both here at the same time as the encoder recode performed here. And then we get a very low latency increase that leaves a 26% increase on the benchmark of different functions. And in terms of energy, I don't remember the exact number, it was also relatively low. 
when it comes to the one solution, now really depends on what code you're using. And what you're looking at is the ratio between how many operations do you need for encode and code compared to how many operations you need for the arithmetic itself. So you can find different codes with different error correcting capabilities. The lower the number of operations they need, the lower the overhead will be. And also you need to consider the function itself. So if you did it on addition, then you're competing with the latency of encoding code versus addition. But if you do it on multiplication, multiplication is much slower. So then you have more time for the encoding code. Do you also have any study, for example, on how your error works, error correct encode works, but for performance energy consumption uh, as a function of the number of bits that you can correct for your error uh, Yes, but I think we should talk about it offline because I don't have numbers off the top of my head. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Actually, uh, uh, <coughs> There was some question from the very beginning of the talk. Okay. Uh, you don't have to go there, yes. So uh, the, the way you uh, perform this computation is basically uh, you read values from like two two of these uh, number stars on yeah on, uh, mm -hmm. on, on the left figure, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so if I remember, you need like uh, different magnitudes of the current or voltage you apply to these memory stores when you need to write or read some of it, right? So uh, maybe I didn't understand exactly how this mechanism works, but uh, how is that voltage difference or the current you apply is enough mm -hmm. to write the results for you to be uh, results in our story? I think I'll explain in more depth what happens here and then it'll be better. So first off, as you said, our mystery store is the resistance, and we said that low resistance is going to be one, high resistance is going to be zero. Yes. Right? What we want to write is that our mystery put a very high current, high voltage causes high current, changes the state. We want to read, we put a low voltage, measure the current. Question is logic. What we want to do here is something called stateful logic. That means we're not reading the states of the remissors, performing the logic outside and writing it back. We want to really perform the logic using the remissors themselves while still remaining inside the resistance domain. Okay. All you can do here we have the in and the out. It's not input and output. It's two fixed voltages, one for the inputs, one for the outputs. For example, one volt and zero volt. And then we have this structure. And if we initialize this at uh, the bottom to have a low resistance, then you can see what happens. If both of them have high resistance, then this portion of the circuit is going to have a relatively high resistance. The overall circuit has high resistance, and then we don't see much current flowing. We apply one volt and you get a low current. Low current will mean that the state of this remissure will not change significantly. But if at least one of them was an one, meaning low resistance, then you get through that remissure a high current. The high current flows in this direction through the remissure, which increases its resistance, changing it from low resistance to high resistance. So what we got is if at least one of the inputs was a one, then the output becomes a zero. And that's exactly an rate. So regarding this, did you explore different tiny cannot configurations, like how many inputs you can put, how many outputs you can drive? Yes. So if you look at the theoretical works that simulated these circuits, there are many different approaches to how many inputs you can have. For example, you can do an N input NOR, where instead of taking the NOR of two cells, you're taking the NOR of N cells, store that in a single cell. Uh, from what I'm familiar with the device experimental settings, if you're not familiar, there's only been two remissors input, one output, sometimes three inputs and one output for majority. Uh, but I haven't seen anyone experimentally demonstrate a larger n uh, But something that's important here is actually that this circuit has been experimentally demonstrated. Both at our lab and at other labs, they're able to take the circuits, perform it in actual physical devices, and see the results. Cool. Yes. Okay. Yes. How much control do we have in competitive harvester modules? What do you mean control? So can we derive three different bit lines at the same time, the current protocol? So you're asking how can we apply three different voltages at once? Yes. Okay, great. The real tools. Yes. So you're right, in regular memories, you can only apply a single voltage on one of the bit lines. And it goes back to how the decoder structure is built. You have a single decoder that receives the and a binary representation of the bitwise column you want, then it outputs only on that a voltage. 
we have a work from 2016, I believe, that designs the periphery for the case where you want three different devices to select. Essentially, you can say it has three different decoders, and each decoder is responsible for one bit line. And then you use that to perform to apply three different voltages at once. And you can go back to that paper and the overhead compared to just having one decoder was out of the above. One more question. I'm just a bit confused on this like type of orbit that you're showing there. I mean, which kind of application is it this kind of data layout, for example? Do you do transposition or do you have a specific application where the layout is set like that? You mean where the layout is complex? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. So most significant limitation throughout was that we can only do operations if they're aligned. If all the rows have the same indices for where you're selecting the operations, right? In arithmetic, we have that. In arithmetic, we have each row representing a different function and a different set of two inputs. But the function itself is the same. We're applying the same NOR gates throughout. That actually was one of the difficulties with floating points. How do you take floating points, which is supposed to do something else in different row, but convert it back to this format, where all the rows do the same thing all the time? So for arithmetic, if you have the data aligned, for example, here on these four columns, one number, on these four columns, a different number, then you can add the two of them together using the throughput of arithmetic. The next part was how do you the next part was how do you design an application so that when you do that vector arithmetic, the data is live. So if for example we went back to F15. Here the question was how can we have every time one perform a butterfly operation, the data aligned according to which pairs need to be compared? So in this first part, one to compare x0 and x1. And x0 and x1 were lined together. I also want to compare x2 and x3, x2 and x3 are together. And then we perform butterfly operation. The next butterfly operation needed x0 and x2 and x1 and x3 together. So you perform this swap, and now x0 and x2 are together, and x1 and x3 are also together. So essentially, we're designing an application to have that major arithmetic functions be performed in parallel by aligning the data at the right place at the right time. And we try to minimize the number of operations we need in between to perform these shifts. So, for example, here we found the net shift that's necessary instead of going through that intermediate state above. Does that answer your question? So, you have control over the data plate, the initial data placement, and yes. the, you know the address mapping beforehand as well. So, you can know at any given time an operation is executed where the data is placed in a particular row column. So yeah. the algorithm can leverage this and uh, do the computation if swapping or anything required. Exactly. And also in one of our works, we talked about how you can integrate that, for example, with virtual memory, where in virtual memory, you don't necessarily know that's going to be aligned in crossbars. And there we do it in granality of a page. So we have a mechanism that enforces that each page will be kind of a group of crossbars, not split in between crossbars. And then within that page, you can design your algorithm however you like. You're no longer limited by the other restrictions of the other programs. You can have that free space to use however you like. Okay, any other questions? I have a question about something that you said was a challenge, but you didn't touch here too much. Uh, probably some other you know, people work on that, which was the architecture aspect of it. Yes. Um, could you give a brief uh, summary of what? Uh, what you think was the most challenging uh, aspects of, of architecture design for crossing memory? What uh, needs to be done? Uh, mm -hmm. SF or what did they, where they, or where the lower hanging fruits are for, for architecture design? Mm -hmm. uh, so, when it comes to the architecture, I think one of the largest problems is virtual memory. And for that, you can have the approach that we did before, where you're working in reality of pages. Because virtual memory, you first of all, have to decide if it's an accelerator or if it's main memory. Are you designing this memory to be an accelerator for a specific application? And you can do whatever you want. Or is it supposed to be part of the main memory of the actual computer? And the benefit when you're doing it as the main memory of the computer is that the data that belongs to the computer stays in the same memory. But now it becomes much more complex. So how do you manage that? How do you allocate those pages? How do you see what happens inside each page? So that's for virtual memory. Other than that, there are questions like cache coherency. In regular computers, the memory is supplemented with many different caches. Each cache can store an updated value. So if an entry belongs in if an entry is stored in the cache, the data that's stored there could be the correct value, and what's stored in the memory is incorrect. And then how can you still be processing in memory when it's possible the data you're looking at in the memory isn't even the latest data? 
And for that, we have a recent work, but I'm not sure if it's published yet, so I won't talk too much about the details. Uh, it's been accepted, but I'm not sure if it's open yet. And other than that, there are questions of the physical architecture itself. How do you design the hardware? For example, what happens if you want crossbars to be able to communicate? In Racer, they discussed a mesh architecture, which means each crossbar can communicate with four of its neighbors. And that's something that gives you a lot of power algorithmically. If you can design an algorithm that uses many crossbars and has that operation of distributed data communication, it goes a lot back to the theory of distributed computing, where you have locations local within each crossbar and lower but still significant throughput for communication between different crossbars. And then the question is back in the architecture, how do you design the overall memory to support that? What are your instructions? How can you have communication between different crossbars that's still standardized in the form? And I think those are the three main challenges. Yes. Do you think like Autosman or some modern GPUs provide something colorful or they compute, for example, a unified memory between the GPU memory and the CPU when you have implicit coherence? Why is using things not suitable for this particular kind of application? For example, even if you use the beam as a slurry to itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I see there is a, a, a bit of challenge for the structure itself, but do you see like anything that can be possible, for example, in my cartridge? Yeah, so, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that unified memory in GPUs is more of a simplification for the programmer yes. than it is something in the hardware. Because yeah. at the end of the day, what it does is just copies behind the scenes the data, yeah. which means that if you're looking at the actual acceleration, if you wanted to avoid that data transfer from the CPU memory to the GPU memory, then it doesn't really help that it's just a simple for the programmer. Right, you still have the same data transfer, you're still bottlenecked by some performance. Here, you could do the same for the program, it would be simpler, but at the end of the day, the throughput doesn't change. Now, for example, for GPUs, when you're working on GPUs, a lot of the times you try to keep all the data that you need within the GPU memory. For example, when you're training neural networks, all the weights are stored always within the GPU memory. You don't bring them every time in CPU memory. That's for the same reason, so you can avoid that data transfer, even if it's implicit it's in the code. But I think you also want to provide some easy and programmability because I, I will think like the app that you involve everything, right? So then if you go to specific to the way that's too hard to program and they also have a challenge to adapt the technology itself. Mm -hmm. So I think like even programming the system is part of the package, I would say, because as an architect, you design something program is to program it. Mm -hmm. And I think programming should be part of it. That's why I ask it. Because how you provide something that is to program and you know on the rest as you say. So. Yes, for that, I actually agree. And there's another aspect of our work that I didn't talk about here, which is trying to design a compiler for processing memory. Yeah. Similar to what you have in CUDA, where you design code in relatively similar to C++ form, and you want to compile it to underlying processing memory. And if we look, for example, when we said that we have vector arithmetic, they operate on 1,000 rows of parallel. It's very analogous to warps in GPUs. Right? So you can try to design something similar that Extend the model of CUDA, but now also processes within the memory itself. And the goal would be to have something high level you can write code in C and then it's converted back to these operations. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so thank you for inviting me. I'll be here until about 2.30. So if you want to talk further, I'm fully open for that. And also we can talk later on Zoom. Thanks so much for the excellent talk. And yeah, so if you have, I share a code of the one that's got a meeting with you uh, to keep you in. And so feel free to do that. And again, thanks for the excellent talk. Thank you.